Welcome to the Abrams Dicta YouTube channel. Subscribe today and join me, David Abrams, as I explore the world on my Italian scooter and talk about life, law, art, and any other subject that catches my interest. Also, please check out my blog at abramsdicta.com. Although I'm a licensed attorney, nothing here should be taken as legal advice or counsel. If you're looking to contact me professionally, please go to my website, www.dhabramslaw.com. Welcome to another episode of Abrams Dicta, where we explore life, law, and art while riding around on my Italian scooter here in Tallahassee. It's a beautiful day. We're again in downtown Tallahassee, and we're about to go by the CK Steel Bus Plaza. And um, I, want to, I want to take you by here, and then I want to tell you a story about this bus plaza and the... Um, the legal and and social political struggles that came out of this place. Um, this uh, CK Steel Plaza actually has a very important um, role in the history of Tallahassee. This is our our bus our bus terminal, down, downtown bus terminal, and it's named for the Reverend CK Steel. See, there's his his, um, his statue right there, and a lot of people have forgotten. Um, and it and that Tallahassee really has a long history of being a segregated city. And in the 1950s, actually in 1956, there was a bus boycott here in Tallahassee because of segregation of the buses. And um, two FAMU students, um, young women uh, actually rode on the bus here and they were arrested and they were charged with inciting a riot because they refused to go to the back of the bus here in Tallahassee. Um, that led to organizing by students at Florida A&M University, which Florida A&M is a historically black university here in Tallahassee. Um, I actually um, was very privileged to have taught there for a semester. I taught uh, journalism to law students. Um, and um, the students from Florida A&M University, um, they, they, uh, they weren't going to put up with this. And so they organized. And one of the people from the community who led the organization was uh, Reverend C.K. Steele. And what he did was he helped organize a boycott of the bus system. And uh, it was not that different than what was happening in other cities throughout the South at that time. Uh, again, this is 56, 57. Um, the, the, um, the Montgomery bus boycott, I, I think, was going on at that time. The, um, but anyhow, what they did is they set up a, um, basically a system of private cars so that uh, black people in Tallahassee could boycott the bus. They could get around and they didn't have to take the bus system. Well, the city fathers, who were, of course, all white at that time, um, they didn't like that. So they charged these, these folks um, with operating an, an, an illegal for hire service. Basically, they were unli unlicensed cabs. And, and they arrested Reverend C.K. Steele and a bunch of his supporters. Um, and, and, and ultimately convicted them, and, and I think the, there was, a, the, my understanding is the prison sentence was suspended, but they were fined $11,000. So basically what the city did is they found a racially neutral statute and used it to enforce the racism. Um, Reverend Steele, C.K. Steele, he went around the country and he raised money to pay the legal expenses and the costs and things like that and really became the figurehead of this movement. Um, during this time, the U.S. Supreme Court issued an opinion in the Montgomery case that found that segregated busing was unconstitutional. Um, and, you know, some cities, they reacted. I guess Tallahassee for a while shut down its bus service. Rather than integrate, they would just shut it down. And southern cities were doing that with... Um, with like public pools, and I think even one one state maybe uh, even shut down its schools. It shut down the public schools rather than integrate. Um, Tallahassee for a while went to a system of assigned seating, um, 
there never really was a formal peace treaty in this. I, that, that's my understanding. But uh, as as uh, you know, black people in Tallahassee started riding the bus and sitting basically where they wanted to. They um, people got used to it. What do you know? They survived. You know, they um, what what people thought was you know just intolerable really turned out to be not a big deal at all. Um, so um, that's that's a very abbreviated history of the Tallahassee bus boycott. It's um, to me it's a fascinating story of Tallahassee history. Um, it uh, you know it, it's you know it's not a very proud part of history at all. Um, but it is the story, and I, th I think the stories have to be told. Now, there is a follow-up part to this story, in that I, you know, I don't know that we've finished the work on this type of stuff. Um, when I was a public defender, um, I noticed that there were young black men on a regular basis, on a routine basis. They were coming in, these were juveniles, I was working in the juvenile delinquency section, and they would be charged with trespassing at the bus station. And basically what would happen is if they stayed too long at the bus station, and that meant if they didn't get on immediately on the bus, the next bus leaving, um, and depart the bus station, they, they would be trespassed from the bus station, and then if they came back, they were arrested. Now, understand that these kids were part of, um, these buses were used for their high school education. It was, they, were, they were used instead of school buses. And sometimes they would stay at the station and they'd talk with their friends and they'd kind of hang out there before everybody went home. It's a very natural thing, I think, for teenagers to do. Um, anyhow, I took one of these cases to trial and during that trial, I subpoenaed the bus. The bus company at that point was Taltran, and I subpoenaed all the. I knew they took photographs. I subpoenaed all the photographs of the young people, of of, of actually everybody that was given a trespass warning at the bus station. And I got a list. I don't know. It's probably 25, 30 photographs. I don't remember exactly how many. It was a bunch, and. There were basically two white homeless guys and all the rest of them were young black men. Every last one of them, without exception. And um, I was a new lawyer. And, you know, they, they say don't ever ask a question in trial you don't know the answer to. And so what I did is I had one of the executives from Taltran on the stand. And um, I, um, I asked him, I laid out all these photographs and I said, do you see a uh, predominant characteristic in all these people that you guys are giving the trespass warning to. And he looked at me and he said, yeah, they're all young. And it really kind of threw me off guard because I was, I wanted him to say, you know, look, they're all black. But he, you know, he, he ducked that one pretty well. Um, I would love to tell you that I won that trial. I did not win that trial. Uh, although the, the judge, we didn't have a jury, we only had a judge. The judge really didn't do anything to my client. Um, and, and I think the judge, um, you know, the judge, I think this trial was called for like 10 in the morning. And, and we didn't start that trial at like 4 in the afternoon and then it ran to like 7 o'clock at night. So everybody's there late. And the judge had all these, these you know, these cops and these, um, uh, these executives. From the, they, I think the city attorney was there. And he made them all sit out on the bench. And there's, these, there's these wooden benches outside the courtroom and so he made them all sit out there on the wooden benches um, basically all day long which uh, I'm sure was not a pleasant experience for them um, and I, I remember because I met with the city attorney afterwards and um, and I told him I said look I said you guys keep doing this I'm gonna recommend every one of my clients take these cases to trial um, and, and he told me, he said, you know, I think we, we, we're going to have to find a different way of handling this. And um, so for a long time, those, those cases went away. Um, it's my understanding that, that uh, they, uh, they started doing it again a couple years ago. I don't know if they're still doing it. Um, it pisses me off that they, they do that kind of stuff, that they charge these kids with crimes for things that really aren't crimes at all. And, um, and that it, it really seems to be very racially motivated. You know, this, you know, people talk about the, the, 
you know, school to prison pipeline. And, you know, let me tell you, you know, it, it, it's it's true. It, it, you know, if you, you work in juvenile delinquency, and if, if you're a poor kid, if you're a kid of color, stuff like that, um, you, you know, very often you are not judged to the same standard. School administrators will, will look over things for wealthy white kids that they, they don't, um, they don't forgive and poor kids and then black kids. It just, uh, it, it's shameful. It, it's shameful. And so, anyways, um, that's all I got for you today. That's the, uh, the Tallahassee bus boycott. Um, you know, there's a lot more history, and I may not have told it exactly correctly. I think I got the major facts correct. But, um, you know, there's websites out on the Internet. You can go look at this. It's an interesting story. It's one, you know, if you live in Tallahassee, heck, if you live in America, you should know this story. Um, but um, anyhow, um, thanks for, ch for checking in with me. Thanks for taking the ride with me. Um, uh, you know, I look forward to, uh, to seeing you on other rides. And please, you know, give me a comment. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. Maybe subscribe to my blog. Um, you know, a little thumbs up on the uh, YouTube uh, video. I love that when I get that. That means a lot to me. So take care, guys. Bye-bye.